Um, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Tony Wachiku. Um, I'm a producer and educator based in London. I also run CDR. CDR is an organization that's very passionate about creating opportunities for music producers and artists to come together to share what you're working on, um, compare reverb tales and EQ on your reverb or whatever, um, but ultimately a safe place to basically develop your music. Um, and we're also very fortunate enough to have opportunities like this to speak to people who are part of our, you know, part of our kind of music production lineage. Um, and without, I just can't even say his name because he's in front of me, Rob Gordon, give it up. Thank you. And for the next 45 minutes or so, we'll, um, yeah, get into his practice, I guess, as a music producer, as an engineer, as someone who's been very much fundamental and foundational in terms of the kind of British bass-led music. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, Rob, for being with us. How are you, sir? Good today. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's start at the beginning. Um, when did you know that working in the music industry, you know, with the skills that you had was something that you wanted to, you know, delve in and do full time? and it will be something that drives you from an income perspective? Well, it wasn't a decision. It was a thing where, um, because I knew how to do it, then I'm elected to do it. Okay. So it was simply like that from operating the record player in the big family, I'm elected to the one told to play the records and the parties and, you know, cause I could change a fuse and then I, I could uh, program the video recorder and you know, it's just big the, Ferguson ones with the big. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it went as far as um, the community centre buying a porter studio, and then hunting me out because I would know how to operate it because I could operate anything if you got the instructions. I was reading it. And it's, oh. <laughs> so I guess for a long time you were fix it, Rob. Then, generally speaking, Bob can fix it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're saying that you know, um, you know, you've always had kind of a a passion for electronics. Um, can you tell us a bit, a little bit about that growing up and, you know, how did you kind of express yourself through resistors and capacitors? What did that look like? Well, uh, apart from light changing the fuse or whatever, I think the big thing for me was um, when you're a kid, you might see how to, that magazine where you build a battleship, you buy series one and then you da da da. Well, I had that with hobby ele electronics. I managed to get series one, two and three all at the same time. And then I just started building all the music-based projects projects, and got them mostly working on. I just thought, well, this is Dr. Walter, really. And do you remember the first um, um, electronic thing that you were most proud of? Do you remember what it was? Yeah, well, the one that I was really proud of was the, the doorbell, <laughs> where I'd built an um, analog sequencer and an oscillator. And when you push the door, my mum's doorbell, <laughs> you got this random sequence of notes from the resistor ladder that I'd done to do the different pictures. And it was just to prove to myself, I can build an analog sequencer and I can build an oscillator. I think you were onto something there, you know. Analog sequencer ring bell. Yeah. That's some... You didn't think about taking it stage further and maybe... Well, well that, yeah, I was at school. I couldn't afford to take it further. It was just a thing where when I've got some money, I've, I've got this circuit, it's there to prove, do you know what I mean? And then I could expand on it when I could afford the big panel and all the controls or anything. So did you take your passion for electronics further, as in, you know, did you go to, you know, college or, you know, go to university to, le to learn the same those field skills? No, no. no? I, I considered it and then I was, I found out that anything I invented would belong to the university. And I thought it might be my best stuff. So I just skipped that one. So what did you do instead? Well, I operated the port studio and then um, a group in Sheffield got a, a major com a, a major deal. Right? I think it was uh, quite famous at the time for the amount of money it was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Chack. Okay. And they bought a brand new 24-track studio. And then they um, somehow came across one of my Porter Studio demos and reckoned it sounded better than their studio. So then I got a job interview. Yeah. So from your Porter Studio antics, you then got to, I guess, work at the studio, right? Font Studio. Yeah, it was a, it was a, from yeah. Cass cass cassette four track straight to 24 track two inch. Okay. 
so I guess falling so I guess a lot of what you're saying is that a lot of your opportunities you've kind of fallen into you know via your skills as an elect someone in the world of electronics right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I mean even when I started the studio uh, I'd done a lot of formal music training so I could sight read drums or I could compose on manuscript paper or whatever and the equipment at the time was manuscript only to get the sims to play so I could operate it but if you didn't know <laughs> how to operate a synth and write sheet music yeah. you couldn't do it but I could the skill set again yeah. so again you were very unique and in the right yeah. place at the right time That's yeah. It. yeah so yeah so tell us a little bit about the you know the early days of of you know fond as a studio as a studio I mean you know fond is definitely you know foundational to the obviously the sound of the north obviously Sheffield but in retrospect I think it's um it's one of those play it's what it's a reminder how important a studio is and how community is built around the studio in terms of the artists that pass through the talent that are support artists coming through um, and what's unique about you is that you know you've got this really good balance of having this really grounded technical cap capability but also you have this background in music right and you're able to kind of flex both of those skills in different ways mm -hmm. being at fond so talk us through what it was like you know from your you know, getting this job at Fon to then starting to work on projects. How did that, how did that manifest itself? Because from what you're saying, it's not as if you studied being a recording engineer or a producer. It's almost like, it feels like you fell into that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I started as um, a, a second level engineer and um, <coughs> my, <coughs> excuse me, my first project at Fon was with, um, I think his name was Frank Rosa from... Um, America and the producer uh, Richard Burgess from New Zealand or Australia. So it was like, you know, proper big time 48 track recording session with two 24 track machines and a synchronizer. <laughs> it was just like the highest level. And that was one of my first ones. And uh, But my first one should have been with Sly and Robbie, but they'd left a week before I went from the interview. You must have. That must have frustrated you. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, oh, Slime Robbie was here last week. <laughs> so we were talking about the studio environment and particularly for newer producers who haven't had the opportunity to work in a studio. Can you talk us through what it was like for you and the relationship between, say, you, other engineers, you know, the kind of studio culture and community? Can talk tell, talk us through what that was like for you? Okay, well... Um, Fon Studios was um, a, a typically good studio for the time. So that would mean you'd have um, a 24-channel tape machine, a desk that can take that, and hopefully double 15-inch monitors, and a live room and a few... S when, when I started, MIDI was brand new. So, like I was saying about the, it was the first MIDI computer was a Yamaha CX5, manuscript entry only. You couldn't play a keyboard and make it record it. You had to actually, <laughs> and there wasn't even a mouse. Sure. Yeah, but I think the fair lights like that or something. I've never used one of those. And so, it's a it's a thing where you'd be at home, you've got whatever. I think what what I think it'd be a seven or seven would be around then. Very, 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 very Roland 707. Yeah. So it's very, very early MIDI days. I think the drum machine we had was a sequential circuits, okay. which might have been the first MIDI drum machine. Absolutely. So were, the, were these all clocked via, did you, did you sort we're, the MIDI out? Or we, were you yeah, using we were using DBS, MIDI, yeah. MIDI from this um, yeah. Yamaha computer. So that was the latest thing at the time. And so, because we had that equipment there, it was tempting to use it, I suppose. <laughs> so, and of course, you were the technical one, so you got to set it all up, right? Yeah, well, I got there and it, it was already working, but I could um, operate anything that was there. I think there was a, a, a green gate sampler, okay. which I didn't bother with on an Apple computer. So I admit, I didn't learn that. I just I just got an Akai instead. <laughs> Um, and I guess, yes, Fon must have been a, um, a, a, a huge focal point in Sheffield at the time, right? Particularly yeah. because a lot of, you know, for a lot of producers, having access to a studio that was, you know, had great people like yourselves working there was accessible 
you know, it must have been a huge thing for people. Yeah, well, it wasn't that accessible. It was a private studio. It wasn't really a studio. It was a studio built to make an album because the, the band reckoned that they, with the budget that they projected to spend in London, that they could build a studio in Sheffield yeah. with that budget. So that's, that's what the they chat, did. That's the advance that they got. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Sure. The album didn't do well, and they were, and they were going to close the studio. And um, I, it was my suggestion to run it commercial because they've got a record label, Fon Records, and you've got the studio, so why would you close it down? Mm -hmm. You can record these other bands, which I didn't know about at the time. But, you know, being in Sheffield, you, you see posters on the wall for indie bands. I went into India. And, and they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, these bands like um, 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 Pulp, Treebound Story, Artery, you know, I see them on the posters. Mm -hmm. And I and, and John Peel sometimes plays them, so why don't we just record them and put them out on the label? And they agreed and kept it open and, you know. And the rest is history. Yeah, I think my first record is um, features Richard Hawley, for example. And that's the first time I got to be in charge of making a record. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So with that, you know, being in charge of making a record, just for some context, if you've got obviously a technical background, but suddenly you're having to, you know, learn how to mix, you know, um, using a 24 track desk and, you know, all this hardware, how, how did you, how did you learn to use that equipment? How did you learn from being someone who's quite technical to being someone who was essentially, you know, an engineer, then obviously into, into production? Um, um, I suppose in the after the job interview, they said um, some of the equipment might be a bit technical for me because I'm 17 or whatever. So I, I said, like what, for example, and, and and then I convinced them to let me go in the studio for 20 minutes or something, and I'll let them know if there's something beyond me. And I told them there's nothing beyond me, and I can work tomorrow. It's just you know, if you do electronics. You, it says it, what it does on it. <laughs> you know, it's quite easy, really. Yeah, sure, it says yeah. it, you know. Yeah. So what kind of equipment was in the studio at the time? Well, we're talking early 80s, right? Yeah, so, with yeah. JBL double 15s. Yep. Amec Angela Desk. Mm -hmm. um, Soundcraft tape machine, not so good. Revox mastering. Sony. Um, before the Sony DAT machines, it was the Sony um, Betamax video recorder. Okay with uh, F1, the yeah, F1 yeah, thing, yeah, or yeah, the 701, yeah, it was the F1, yeah. and then it was the Sony, that thing. Yeah. And um, the samplers, we started out with um, an Akai, where, where it took a mini disc, and you had to load six discs yeah. for So the S15900 or the 1000 that was? It was, it was before the 1000, okay. before the 1000 there was an Akai. Uh, so which one, the very first one? I think, was it a 7000? Not the very first one, the second generation of the first one. So you could get it as a keyboard, and, okay. and we had it as a keyboard, mm -hmm. and we, in fact, I made a separate outbox for it, because there was a socket on the back for connecting to a synth. Of course you did. And I realised that it had the six outputs. Of course you did. Box. So we got this <laughs> six outs of this. <laughs> There's a box with some wires, that's all it was, there were no components. I hear that. <laughs> it's a unique skill. It's a mm. very unique skill. Mm. Um, I'm going to play something from that era. I'll yeah. just play it and you can just tell us something about it. Okay. Yeah?
Sache. And, uh, what I'd like to say about that record to start with is the B side of that record, Jack's Back, is the first bleep record. Okay. It just is because you can play it and it's, it's bleeps all over the place. Mm -hmm. That was Mark Gamble and myself's idea. Mm -hmm. So can somebody repair the Wikipedia entry saying it was DJ <laughs> Parrot? We'll get that sorted. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so talk to us about this tune. It was this is one of, obviously one of the you know early records from the whole Fon time. Um, you know beginnings of you know you working with Mark. Okay, yeah, just tell us what tell us a bit about this track. It was the first time that I got to work on what I considered black music when I had that job. Okay. I've been working there years, doing all kinds of rock and indie and da 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 da. And then I got offered that, and I jumped on it because I wanted to make something in the studio that I could play my friends and say, oh, listen to what I've done. So as an engineer, this was, a, this was, a, this was a, I guess, a session that came in to actually get the record finished, right? Well, yeah. well, it came into the record company and I ended up being producer. So, so I think this is my second or third record as a producer. Yeah. So given the fact that it was a track that you had a, more of an affinity, affinity with in terms yeah. of the style, you yeah. know, what, what gave it the kind of Rob a sl a stamp? What is what is Rob on this record? Um, to start with, it's a clear sound. I always liked a hi-fi sound, never mind the type of music I like it, where it sounds really good on good equipment. You know, some records only sound good in the club and some only sound good on the radio. And I like mine to sound good anywhere. So I always concentrate on the sound, especially then the bass sound because a lot of records were tinny back then. Yeah, absolutely. So. This bass definitely cuts through in that record. I like the drums perfectly in time. Mm -hmm. I like the new, well, as a job as a producer, I think your main job is to have the diction correct, the tuning correct, and the timing. I mean, it, it can't be faulty. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't like faults on the record. So from a, Pro, um, were you involved in the programming of the record, you know, bringing together the samples, the actual compositional aspects of it? No, it was mainly Mark Gamble, but yeah, okay. but I'd help him program, okay. you know. Sometimes I'd, I'd help him pro, program a synth sound or whatever, yeah. you know. Okay. And I guess this record, you know, ironically did really well, right? Yeah. You know, were you surprised that it was as like, successful as it was? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, it should have been bigger, because I seem to remember there was more than one chart at the time. The BBC had their charts, and there was all these other charts. And on all the other charts, it was number one. But on the BBC, it was number two. Robson and Jerome was number one. Of course. So we could never, never on the BBC, <laughs> ever. <laughs> but how does it feel to have a, you know, a record that... Um you know, you worked on and be very much part of and see your record become successful, you know, particularly at that time when you were transitioning into being a producer, you know, how did well, you feel well, at the time? Well, it's the, it's, the, it's the usual thing. Um, it all turns bitter when you don't really see the money. How do you mean? Oh, is that what happened? Yeah. Okay. So I guess you, I'm assuming that you were paid as, say, a, as a producer, but in terms of royalties, you weren't really part of that line in the budget. I, I did force some money out of them where I did a calculation on the back of a cigarette packet and said you owe me at least this much and I got a check for that and that was it. Okay. So was that about was that about um you know the role that you had at the studio compared to say the role of you, Rob Gordon as a producer? They're, they're, they're separate things. Could that have been what it could have been about, maybe? No ask it in another way, please. So a lot of the time when you work in a studio, if, yeah. a, if a session comes in, mm. you know, you obviously work for hire. And it obviously, depending on what your involvement is, you know, you either work for hire or you're something substantially more. So I guess, you know, it became clear that you're obviously substantially more, right? But mm. maybe they thought of that. They didn't think of it that way. Well, well, it, it, it is what it is, because when you've got the major labels in London, sending tapes and money up to Sheffield asking me to remix. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, whatever problems there is, it's not mine. Sure. It's something getting projected around somewhere. Yeah, fair, fair enough. 
So let's play one more, because um, at this time, you kind of were on fire. Did you get any sleep at all? You know something, it was a bit bad. You know, it, it, it was actually quite a bit bad. You, you know, smashed I, it. I, 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 was, like... I, I was getting stomach ulcers and you name it. It was I was physically suffering. So I guess you were just really passionate about the music and really passionate about being in the studio environment, right? Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, just I was just, I was just... But what was driving you? Was it was was it the, your dedication to the music that was driving you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I, I, I can I can hear music before it's. I can hear music in my head. I can compose in my in my mind. And um, yeah, I thought it. I thought well. I, I found out that people wanted to hear what I could make up. So it's just a case of having an opportunity to make up a piece of music and get it released at any opportunity. Yeah. And it was fantastic because again, you know, just looking at your output at the time, and obviously beyond that, but definitely at that time, that kind of window of time in the kind of late eighties. Obviously, it was like you know what was happening culturally was very significant in the UK in terms of the emergence of you know dance music becoming really you know. Summer of Love and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think for me, again, back then, looking at Sheffield and looking at the whole fond environment, it just felt that you were this kind of work workhouse, you know, working on some amazing records and working on some amazing mixes at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And the fact that, yes, you're just literally, you must have, Fond must have been open 24 hours, you know, 24 seven. Yeah, I yeah, guess. yeah. So, I mean, some, some sessions I'd, I'd wake up on the sofa at nine in the morning, <laughs> you know? And, and then go home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know. I'll play another one, another couple from that era. Um, and this one I thought was quite interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Hold on a second. So this is a remix that you did for The Associates, um, track entitled Half of the Heart of Glass. Yes, that's right, the Blondie cover. Yeah. So is this, yeah, how did that come about? Was this a similar kind of request from London? Yeah, yeah, yeah just yeah. straight, you know, on the telephone to the management office, uh, the blah, blah, blah. They asked me, Are you, am I interested? How much is it? Send up the tape, do it, send it back, get me money. <laughs> <laughs> simples. Yeah, it's simples, yeah. So how did you, yeah, so do you recall how you kind of approached working on this um, remix? Um, you, you, well, but, but it's, it's simple. It's like, um, I, I like music. And if I can make this into something I want to dance to personally, I think it's that good. It makes me want to dance myself. And I think that's about it. I mean, everything's there. It's my fault if it's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what they want. I'm employed to do it. I've got to make something what makes people dance. Mm -hmm. And if I can't feel it, I wouldn't expect anybody else to. And were you absorbed by, you know, what were, where were your influences coming from at the time in terms of the kind of, you know? Oh, uh, well, uh, house, it's a funny thing for me, house music. Um, a few of my school friends tried introducing me to Trax Records. Mm -hmm. I can't remember, I'm a dog and all this other stuff, Willy Wonka and whatever else. And I thought it was terrible. Was that compositionally or or, or, or production wise? Both. It was just like, oh gosh, you know, it, it was it was nowhere near. There as... are some bangers though. 
Oh, Virgo, uh, Virgo. You can't mess with Virgo. Eventually, eventually. But I'm talking the early stuff. You know, it, I mean, I, I, I said, I think I know why they call it house music. Sounds like it's made in somebody's house. I hated the stuff. It's just like amateur bill to me. So you wanted to do something about that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So my house records, oh, you can play them on a expensive hi-fi, whereas you would play that tracks on a Lin Son deck. Yeah. <laughs> it'll sound. <laughs> it'll sound. A particular way. It'll sound. <laughs> I mean, I, yes and no. I mean, let me think of one now. Um, so, so some of the tracks, I'm just trying to think of one I, I really like. I do like some of them. Like, obviously, this dub love and whatever. But um, something I want to talk about later, the difference between analog and digital. Because some of that track stuff was that cheap, it ended up being 100% analog. Yeah, in terms of the signal path, right? In terms yeah, of the signal. Yeah. And then we, then we had to record it onto yeah. a cassette or yeah. a reel-to-reel because -reel we can't afford a digital recorder. And then it'd be cut in a, a studio without, you know, the, the vinyl cut would be cut without very groove because the system hasn't got a digital delay to do the spaces between the group. So accidentally, like a lot of Jamaicans, accidentally end up 100% analog. And when that happens, you play it on a massive system and it sounds better than all the modern records. Because <laughs> of the analog, yeah, yeah. the pure analog chain. Yeah, yeah so. So, yeah. so I guess, yeah, just to cycle back a little bit. So your, your, you know, your house music, um, Rob's housing was kind of in response to the, the, the quality, you know. Yeah. The quality wasn't Rob's quality yeah. out there, so yeah. Rob's doing something about it. Yeah. So again, Rob's going in the lab and basically fixing. You yeah. Know? If, if, the, if, if I think this is what you want, so I'll try it like this. Yeah, got you. Yeah. So what kind of things did you do in the studio to kind of get that kind of high quality sound? Was it about um, obviously your prowess in terms of mixing, but were there particular bits of equipment or EQ, you know, analog, you know, EQ that you're using, apart from the desk, were there, yeah, what were the equipment and techniques you were using to get this sound that you're talking about? Um, it was a choice of equipment. There was plenty of equipment there. At, at that time, my favorite sampler, at the time of that record, my favorite sampler was a Casio. The FZ series. Yeah. yeah. And next, sat next to it is an Akai, but I pre preferred the Casio. You know, so it's about listening and being attentive. It's not how much it costs, you know. I'd always use a, a Juno 106, but I've been known to use that 106 for a hi-hat sound, <laughs> you know, but that was my go-to synth, is it? Juno 106. Yeah. So when you're, when you're mixing, well, when you're, you know, whether you're remixing, producing, you know, is there a kind of balance between Rob the technician and Rob, the actual, you know, producer artist, you know, what's the back, what's the ratio, do you think? Or is that something you're not, you know, you're no, not talking about? No, it'd just be 50-50 about, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I mean, and engineering for me is a lot easier because I wouldn't try to use a rubbish sound in the first place. I choose a good sound. Yeah. Whereas remixing, you've got to do a lot of repair. Yeah, yeah. So how did you differentiate between what was you as a remixer in your own right and what you did with as Fond Force? How did you navigate that? Um, it's one of those things where it falls into place. So um, I don't know if you know, I did um, half an album for Yaz. Yes. And um, I, I, got, I got some money. And then I bought a, a, a batch of equipment for myself at home all at the same time. So, you know, like I put in an order for a few thousand pounds back then. So it all arrived at once. And so I've got like this Roland analog synth, a DAP machine, a F, F Casio sampler. I had to go and buy a, a little eight channel mixer for a hundred pounds. Oh, and an M1 keyboard. And then a, fr a friend of mine popped in and said, oh, what's all this on the living room floor? And I explained. And I says, oh, you like house music. I was just gonna put together a little reggae track, but being as you're here, I'll put together a house music track to show you what, what it does. Because he wasn't a musician, this guy, but he was a clubber. I wasn't a clubber. I never went to clubs. And so I put him together this little house thing and gave him a cassette of it. And that cassette ended up being the B side of Track With No Name. Okay. That, that, that was it, it never changed. What happened was he took the cassette to the nightclub. Uh, Winston, right? 
No, no Sean. Sean, okay. It took the, where Winston was DJing. Yeah, okay. And Winston thought it was that good that he popped round with Sean. And I did another one for him, which is the A side. That is track with no name. I'll just do <laughs> just to please my friends. <laughs> oh, you'll like this, you'll like this. Yeah. So again, it was that kind of happy accident. Yeah. Right. So and, we, and let's then, have a listen to that happy accident just for yeah, you. Yeah. Classic. So the, the sound on that sounded different to the other tracks you've played so far. Why is that? Then? Because the, the mixer, the mixer I used. Can you remember what the mixer you used? That's the one that you had at home, right? Yeah, a yeah. hundred pounds brand new. What was that hundred? What by any chance? What was it? It was a front line. Just okay. maybe just. <laughs> oh, the, the the black one with blue with the and one. Yeah. on. Yeah, that's what that was made of. And uh, okay. M M1 mm -hmm. doing the those um, sounds with reverbs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The drums was the F Z, and the bass was yeah, the with Rod nine and nine samples, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the bass was um, the Roland synth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it just happened to be some equipment that was lying in your yeah, room. all done on the living room. And floor. they happened to, and it happens to come out and walk, right? Well, they, so they, had, had, to, they had, had to drag they had to drag me to the club. As a surprise, and I, but I, weren't you even curious? I mean, you know, being a sound man, you, you no, know, they being... didn't tell me. They were just like, "Look, you, Robert, you've got to come to the club." About a month later, you've got to come to the club, and I'm like, "You're not." And the force man, I'm there all night, man. <laughs> and then that, was that uh, because you didn't like the mix, or you know? no, 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 no? The music that they were playing, they were playing, you know, that 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 <laughs> that kind, poor quality that, house that, music. That kind of house I didn't like. <laughs> And, and and my my cassette it was a cassette, was the biggest track of the night, and I looked around and I thought, I've been working for Warner's, EMI, and all these other companies, and they spend thousands to get this reaction. You know, yeah. they'd bribe DJs and also all they'd do anything to get what I've got off this cassette. But listening to it. Um, I couldn't present that to any record company at the time because they just laughed me out the door and said, where's, so where's the song? Okay. It's a different okay. time. Where's the song? <laughs> you know, who, who is the act then? Yeah. And, you know, it's, you have to fit in the sort of thing. And that was just basically street messing about street music. Mm -hmm. So I pressed it up myself because I knew nobody else would do it. So I just I had the money and I just pressed up 500 copies and sold them within a week. Okay. And then I thought, you know something, we better put, put a label on this if I'm going to press up some more. So that's how the company kind of started. So you went from, you know, being dragged to, I mean, okay, let's just take a step back. So you're not too disgruntled that you got 
dragged to the club, are you? I mean, you know, no, it no. was it had its benefits. Right? Yeah, I, it, it, well, yeah, I see why they did it. <laughs> Good. Yeah. That's let's, let's get me clear about that, yeah. right? Because you know, without that, who knows? Maybe the record wouldn't have come out, right? Do you know what I mean? You know? Yeah. Well, it may have yeah, influenced was, your yeah, decision yeah, to yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. Do well, you know what I mean? well, I remember. Um, Parrot, DJ Parrot said to me once, but no, I said to him, I think we was out somewhere and uh, Glenn Park might be in DJing at the Lead Road. And I approached Parrot and I says, I don't, you know, I don't like house, but what's this? This isn't house, what's playing now? And he says, oh, that's nude photo by Derek May. And I says, well, as you know, I don't like house, but I like that, what is that? Is that, he goes, no, that's techno. And I said, well, I like techno. I don't like house. <laughs> I guess, yeah. you know, I guess I'm guessing here that, you know, techno feels a little bit more. There's some skill in it. Yeah, in terms of the, <laughs> the nuancing of the sounds, I guess. Well, yeah, not just yeah. all over this skill. It's not just a drum machine and just boom, 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 and really bad sound. It's, you know, there's somebody that knows what they're doing in a studio, making a record for a change. Yeah. Whereas house, it's like a DJ kind of music, whereas techno is more like a, a professional kind of yeah. look. So, so from, you know, deciding to release the record and, you know, pressing it yourself and then obviously starting a label from that. So tell us how that manifests itself from there. Because again, this record was well received, right? When it came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, it didn't get well received at, this, at Fond Studios. They were really upset that I didn't record it there. You know, and um, yeah, uh, I signed a lot of the Yorkshire acts that had uh, something similar to that. So you'd be like, um, you might have some kind of Jamaican heritage and you're putting a, a bit of bass onto your house techno. I thought that's what would fit on the label. So I ended up approaching and signing all that first wave of war, war packs, you know, like, even Tricky Disco, I even took that one, you know. I suppose my time stopped with um, Top Liquor Unit. That's the, that's after Top Liquor Unit, I'm not involved anymore. Okay, why is that then? And I got asked to leave. Okay. Um, okay, let's just cycle back. So, um, record one comes out, you know, has some kind of critical, co co you know, um, acclaim, um, sets the label on the the, the map. Mm -hmm. couple, you know, Dextrous comes out, a few other label, label records come out. Mm -hmm. You're involved in those in some capacity, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, what happened, you know, for you to go from, you know, being the person who set it up and it was instrumental in, you know, record one, two, three, four. No, it's just, it's just gen know? general usurp usurping, I think they call it. So, you know, you get offered a deal and then you want to keep all the money to yourself. So you just bump one off the side. Okay. So this deal came from... Another. I, I didn't know about it at the time, but the guys got offered a, a deal with Virgin Records and got rid of me as quick so that they could keep the money to themselves. That's not very nice. No, it isn't. Mm. That's not very nice. Put me off music for a while. I can believe it. I can believe it. Particularly for someone like yourselves who's been so dedicated, you know, spent the last two or three years with no sleep, sleep stomach ulcers, oh, oh, And then when I, read yeah. in, when I read in the press that it, it was... Um, it was my decision and all this sort of thing, you know, like I, 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 I walked, you know. So you didn't feel the need to, you know, work with the press to tell your side of the story at the time, no? no. Or was it just too painful at the time? No, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of pain. And then with the little money I've got left, I can't just keep, keep throwing it around in legal services. But plus, I didn't want to damage the scene, you know. I mean, I've got a dispute with Unique Free. And I told them straight, I said, the only reason I didn't take you to court then is because I didn't want to damage this good scene we what we had. You know, put scandal all over it. So is a lot is a lot of this about um, you know, you obviously putting a lot of work into these projects, um, a lot of creative work. Yeah. And not getting recognized for it in terms of, you know, songwriting splits or No, 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 no. No? Okay. Just the payment. Just a payment. As in straight up with just, my feet. Just straight, just straight, you know. So my, there's my name on the label. Why haven't I got no money? Do you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, how, how how's your legal services, Mr. Gordon? And if you're, you know, on universal credit or whatever, it's not happening, is it? So how do you work, you know, just excuse my ignorance, but, you know, 
at Fon Studios, you were a staff member, right? No? Yeah, I was a staff. Or a freelance. Uh, freelance. I, I was a member of staff, and mm. then I ended up being a, a, a prominent shareholder, okay. should I say. Mm. Okay. Um, so then how did it, you know, how did it get to, where's the disconnect between, you know, you being very prominent in the organization and very prominent, particularly in the early days of, uh, well, you know, the record uh, label to suddenly not, you know. It's, where, it's, where, it's, it's the same thing again. When the studio decided to do, I think what did they call it, uh, a reconfiguration or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to close down the studio for um, 24 hours and open it up under a new name. And Robert's bumped off the side again, bumped off the side again. So all my investment just stolen. Okay. Right. Again, not very nice. Um, yeah, I nearly lost my house because that was the guarantee. Sure. And so they took my shares and left me with my house in their business without. <laughs> it was just this terrible, man. Terrible. Um, and I guess. Back then, it was obviously very painful. I was young as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, and at, you know, arguably at the high, you know, at the high point of your career. Well, you know, yeah, yeah, definitely yeah. in a really significant well, I did, point. I, I, right? I didn't. I was that young. I didn't understand. I, I thought competition is when you try and do better than somebody else. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that everybody didn't look at it like that. And now I've learned that competition means getting rid of your competitor. And I wasn't brought up that way, sure. so I didn't see it coming. Sure. Okay. So, yeah, what happened after that? You know, I mean, you know, from someone being really prolific and working on and make some amazing records for a, a really I, I, short but intense period of time, and then you know having I, this transition to I, I had to get I got a job in across town in in, a, in another studio. Meanwhile, my studio's there. I'm having to work for five pounds an hour at another studio across town. That's what happened to me. Okay. Couldn't afford to put out another record. Everybody's stolen all my money. Okay. Not very nice. No, but it's, 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 it's horrible when people approach me and say um, that I, let, I more or less let down their life because I stopped making records. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I always get approached like I decided to stop making records. I've seen it in the press myself. But then a lot of that's about who's telling the story, right? Oh, of, course, know, and, of course, you know, of course, of course. You know, of course. And and you know this. I mean, look, you're still here now. You're still making mm. records. You're still involved in in music. You know, I think that in time you'll be able to, you know, share your perspective on 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 you know things that happened. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I remember one story where. Um, and I know, I think, I think maybe some, some, some people here might know this lady, Sarah Gregory. She used to be married to Glenn Gregory from Heaven 17. She lives in London. And she used to do a, a thing where she'd um, look after us black, not just black, black, but the, the stranded techno musicians in London. So you could stay at her flat for a few hours, meanwhile you're waiting for the train or whatever, yeah. or, you know, even get a... Layover might start. Uh, yeah. Yes, and she'd always do this. Yeah. You know, I think she does the artwork for Transmat Records in, in America. So you see that hand-drawn artwork? Yes. That's by the lady in London. And so um, I've seen her about two or three times. She always used to go on about her friend Karen and, and how she does her friend Karen's hair. And I, I just thought, well, you know, and, she's, and she said, oh, no, but Karen's black. And I'm like, look, I'm from Sheffield, I don't know, you know. And then it came out that it was Karen Wheeler she was talking about from Soul to Soul. So I'm like, well, oh, now I understand why I might know her, but yeah. I don't, right? And then she says, oh, you're from, but you're from Sheffield. I says, yeah. She says, well, Karen keeps on telling me that she got the wrong producers when she went to get her album recorded in Sheffield. I says, well... She says, yeah, she ended up in court for sampling twice of that album. And I says, basically, the album called UK, UK Black, yeah? So she came to Sheffield to record an album called UK Black. And she finds Mark Bryden to do it, not me. 
that's the management quality, what, what was happening to me. It happened a few times where they come for me and Mark Bryden got the job. I'm sorry to get that personal, but basically my job's got given away to other people as if I wasn't there, you know, and it, it caused problems for these other artists with the sampling, yeah. you know. I think there was a problem with acid jazz as well with the sampling. Yeah, yeah and that, that I would, there's jobs sent for me that I could have done without sampling and, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always very tough when you're working in um, partnership with people and, you know, egos, money, you know, all these things kind of start to play, particularly when popularity, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, you know. Uh, conspiracy is between your manager and his, his, his um, university mate. So all my jobs get given to by my manager to his university mate who can't do the job to the standard. You know, it's bound to fail. Sure. And it's very frustrating, isn't it? Particularly when you're in the midst of it all. You know, I mean, how did you, apart from obviously moving studio and setting up a new environment for yourself, how did you cope mentally? With, oh, no, you know, I didn't set up a studio. No, so you moved to another. You oh yeah, yeah. Working I, I, another yeah, I started yeah. working as staff engineer. Yeah. yeah. Not not producer, just staff engineer. Yeah, yeah. Got you. Yeah. A, 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 a studio across town. So how how was that kind of mentally? Because you know, oh, particularly you you no, know, you know, the, the tape machine was terrible. I, I, <laughs> was it a, was it a soundcraft? Soundcraft. They were terrible. It was and it was in good in bad condition. It was terrible. Apart from the tape machine, I was all right though. And you didn't feel compelled to fix the tape machine though. I had a look at it a couple of times, but no, nah. no. Nah. <laughs> cool. Let me see if these guys have got some questions that you want to ask you. Yeah. If you've got questions, stick your hand up. We've got a microphone um, there. One second. Yeah. Okay. None yet. Oh, one in the back. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Right. So my question really is like reggae in your music and just that's it. Your productions, reggae, where, where does that sit? Oh, Bass. yeah. Well, it's a, it's a funny thing, this. Um, it's a case of um, if I'm in a car on the motorway and somebody's put the radio on and I'm forced to listen to the radio or something, I'd like to hear something that I like in that song, whether it's uh, the sound of the bass or whether it's just a little echo there or, you know, things I like about reggae. I like those things in other types of music. So that's how it kind of fits together for me. It, it, in fact, it's a thing where one of my proudest moments was when I heard the Unique Free record, the theme, on a reggae sound system in Sheffield. And they had no idea that I had anything to do with it. They just played it because they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Question over here as well. Hello. Uh, where does the name Ultraviolet Neon Planet come from? I know you you said it in an interview uh, in, the, oh. in the Join the Future book. Uh, oh, yes, yes. It, it, well, it, it, it was, I just made it up. I mean, if I was to shut my eyes and listen to some of that music from then, that's how I'd kind of describe what he's trying to do. And, and not just my music, but a lot of the music from that period seemed like they were facing the same direction musically, which is that ultraviolet, whatever I said. <laughs> yeah, another phrase I like is, um, what, what I used to use back then is organic techno, which meant that um, every waveform is different. So you have to use analog equipment so that there's nothing repeated in terms of waveform. Everything's micro changing. So what, it's a thing where if you get an analog drum machine, you can put it on one pattern and press play. And it might be interesting for five minutes or so. And you, you could sample those sounds, program the same beat, press play, and it might be interesting for about half a minute because the samples, nothing's changing. There's no organic flow of anything. Whereas the analog machines, you know, they, they warm up and they cool down and they sound different when they, you know, there's an, always something happening. So fl fluidity there. Yeah, yeah even yeah. if it's subconscious, it's yeah. not as boring to listen to an analog um, repeating itself than a digital. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Um, 
Is there one more? Is that... Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm just wondering uh, about your process uh, when you're working on records today. Um, so you've mastered a couple of well, a couple of records from groundwork. So uh, stuff that I've produced and essentially what you did uh, for me, anyways, transformed uh, the sound from what I was making into my bedroom into a, an actual actual record and it totally blew my mind back then and listening back to them now it still does so I was just wondering you know what your approach is these days for mastering whether you stick to the analog or various it, it, digital it's an easy it's an easy answer really it's it's about the monitoring system um in this game it, it's not good to get a monitoring system that you switch it on and wow everything sounds brilliant you want a monitoring system that you switch it on and you go, ooh, I didn't, I didn't realise it was that rubbish. That's how you need your monitors. So, you know, I, I like NS10s, Yamaha NS10s for that. I tried them on my hi-fi and they sounded that terrible that I know they're good for music. <laughs> yeah, Yamaha NS1000s, they're good. They, they will tell you when it's rubbish. Um, Genelex, they're poor. I know they're very popular, but Genelex, they're a party speaker for me. You turn it up and it's like, hey, this sounds really good. No good. You need to hear the, the truth and then you can do the work. So um, if, if, if you've got a mix that sounds really good on Yamaha NS10s, many of you all know it sounds good on everything else. So you've got to have your, your monitoring approach like that, you know, re really dry unflattering monitoring and then you can do your work to make it sound good and then it'll sound good on everybody else's speakers. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, any more, is that it for now? Yeah, on the on the subject of, you know, where you're at now, yeah. um, you know, what keeps you busy, you know, nowadays? Um, and tell us a little bit about your thoughts around this kind of analog or digital kind of... Yeah, you know. Did, digital mixing in the box, technically doesn't really work and uh, i'll explain it i'll explain it a few times a few ways actually um when digital mixing in the box first started it reflected in the charts where you hear where the music could have two or three instruments so it would just be a piano a voice and you know there was a lot of empty ballad type music and that suits digital audio because once you bring in everything else, you can't hear a thing. But when you solo it, it sounds great. And then when you put all the other 30 channels back in, you can't hear what you've just soloed. There's a reason for that. It's called um, the mix bus. And the mix bus has got um, it, its bit depth of what it can handle in terms of how many bits it can mix together. And the trouble is most mix buses are 32 bits which means that you can't even mix two 24-bit waves without it disappearing. It's just um, shifting the chairs around the deck, all this kind of thing, you know what I mean? The more you put in, the less mm. you get out. So for, for producers who are making music in the box and got access to, you know, um, how, do they, how, can a, how can a producer today make the most of what's available today, oh, yeah. given that there is this renaissance in hardware. There's obviously some really high quality um, 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 digital emulations of, um, you know, analog, um, you know, hardware well, 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 it's, and, it's, and it's effects. The, it's the same answer. You, if you're mixing in the box, you have to compose your music to be able to mix in the box. So you have as little tracks as possible because the mix bus can't handle it. And once you're aware that the mix bus can't handle it, you'll just have a simple bass sound, a simple drum thing, and a simple thing that comes in. But once you start trying to put that string thing on it, all the drums start disappearing and the bass don't sound. <laughs> it's a funny one. <laughs> You'll have seen it before. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> on an analog system, mm -hmm. you can solo the bass drum and go, right, that's the bass drum. And when you put everything else back in, the bass drum's still there at the yeah. same volume. Yeah, with the same sound, that's untrue in the box. Yeah, I guess that's about, about analog pathways, right? And and capacitors and resistors, right? You know, and trans, you know, and transistors, mm. you know, as opposed to noughts and ones, mm. essentially. Mm. But do you think there will ever be a time when you're happy with digital? Um, yeah, I've, I've built a lot of my own 
digital converters to try and get around the thing. And like I'm saying, I built that Valve master word clock. So I can actually work in the digital domain in a happy way. I've even rebuilt my sound card, op amps and all of that. So I can get what I consider a good sound, but I still don't think it's got the charm of an analog, really. So you're a creature of all habit. You know, there's a problem and, and Rob fixes it with, you well, know. Well, I couldn't afford to buy what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if they made it, actually. So there we go. So, um, so apart from, you know, building, you know, um, hardware devices, you know, what else keeps you busy nowadays? Um, I'm setting up um, a new personal studio. In Sheffield, all the producers have got their own personal man shed studio space so i'm doing one for myself with an analog desk with loads of digital channels coming into this analog summing desk and um, i'm really big 15 inch double 15 inch speakers i'm getting back to that kind I of fear for your neighbors but it's good oh no it's in a, it's in, <laughs> it's in town <laughs> it's in town okay so that's imminent right yeah, I'm, I, that's, that, that, I've listened to the speakers I've, I, and I've got valve amps on them and they do sound quite incredible. Mm. And is, is this for your music making adventures or is it about you setting up as a producer, as an engineer for other people? What are you thinking? Well, I haven't really decided. I think it might be more a showroom for what I'm building. <laughs> That'd be a good idea. Mm. You have a got... demonstration room, you know. Yeah, and you've still got some kit from back in the day, right? Tons of it, tons of it. I think in, I think a showroom with said hardware would be very well received, wouldn't you think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just sowing a seed for helping you <laughs> manifest this idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe not open to the general public. By appointment only. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. By appointment, By appointment only. Mm -hmm. That's a good compromise. Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm sure a lot of people will be on that waiting list. Yeah. Rob, thank you very much for your time, man. And yeah. thank you. Big up.